morning class. We are in Isaiah chapter 13. Moving along rapidly. You'll have to ask somebody for your, their notes from yesterday. I know, that's what concerns me. Um, we are at chapter 13 and we are at the end of at 12 o'clock today we will be half done the course so I know for sure we're not going to finish the book but uh, we do want to get you to do outlining like we started to do yesterday we're going to do some more of that today yes Uh, the heading for this general section, as you see in your notes that I gave you, are is capital I, Oracles Against the Nations. Beginning in chapter 13, moving all the way through chapter 23, uh, Isaiah begins to pronounce judgments against various nations uh, around uh, the nation of Israel, um, around the land of Palestine, uh, beginning with Babylon. Uh, he covers... Um, um, let me see the headings in my Bible again quickly. Uh, prophecy against the Philistines, against Assyria, against Moab, against Damascus, against Cush, which is um, Ethiopia, and against Egypt, and then come right back full circle against Babylon, a prophecy about Jerusalem, about Tyre, and uh, that takes us to the whole earth in chapter four, 24. So, there are a series of oracles here, and I'm not going to cover them all. Uh, I'm going to leave some of them for you to uh, look over on your own time, because they more or less take on the same pattern, and uh, I want to cover what I think are the important ones. Okay, first of all, the oracle against Babylon, which is number one under capital I, Oracles Against the Nations against Babylon, chapter 13, verse 1, to chapter 14, verse 23. Chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 14, verse 23. I've got to get both my King James and NIV out here. And it's at this time in the course where the Bible just naturally falls open to the book that you're studying. My Bible always opens to Isaiah now. Yeah. Um... First of all, in chapter 13, verse 1, to chapter 14, verse 2, we have Babylon's destruction. Babylon's destruction. 14, verse 2. 14, verse 2. And what a destruction it is. In verses 1 to 5, we have the Lord mustering the army himself. I find this interesting. Everywhere where you see uh, God moving, he uses men, sometimes men who are enemies of God, to do his will. And the biblical language then becomes that God did it. It was God's hand. Uh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but God will hold Pharaoh responsible for hardening his heart. It's, it's, this is one of those mysteries that, that Chang likes to... Uh, notice in the word where uh, you can't understand the relationship between the sovereignty of God and the free will of man and here God musters armies against Babylon and you know whose armies these are these are the Medes and the Pers Persians this is the next empire to come along by the way Isaiah is prophesying this naming Babylon by name even though it is not in power yet and seeing Babylon's armies being destroyed by the next king that arises which is Medo-Persia um, and he, uh, as, as destructive and as godless as the armies of Medo-Persia are, it is God who musters the armies. Okay? This is the biblical language, and this is how you have to understand it. So God is mustering the armies in verses 1 to 5. This period of time in verses 6 to 13 is described three times as the day of the Lord. Verse 6, How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. 
it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And then again, uh, pardon me, verse 13, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and the day of his fierce anger. Now, some of this, of course, is fulfilled in history, but aspects of this aren't yet, are they? What what portions of this would you pick out and say, well, this is yet to come? Okay. Those are apocalyptic signs, aren't they? that you read about in um, well, Daniel and as well as Matthew and Revelation. Well, I'm not sure about Daniel, at least Matthew and Revelation, where the, the, the signs in the sky uh, will take place. So here we have again that aspect of the near fulfillment and the far fulfillment, uh, where the day of the Lord in general means whenever God comes down in judgment. Um, but specifically the day of the Lord refers to uh, that period of time during the tribulation and also the great white throne judgment the, the ultimate culmination of his judgment so in verses 6 to 13 we have this uh, judgment against Babylon described as the day of the Lord Technically, it's mentioned two times, and the third time it's described just in a bit of a different order. So I'm not sure whether this is, in verse 13, whether it's really the day of the Lord. It just says, in the day of his fierce anger. I think one could safely say that that's the same, uh, it means the same thing. <coughs> Only the vocab vocabulary is just a little bit different. In verses 14 to 18, we have the human losses and the cruelty described. It shall be as the chaste roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children shall also be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled, their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes. So not only are the Babylonians mentioned specifically, uh at least a century before this happens uh, but the Medes are mentioned specifically I will stir up the Medes against them which shall not regard silver and as for gold they shall not delight in it their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb their eyes shall not spare children here again things are repeated Do you notice that this is poetry and Babylon the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellence shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. The glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. All of their glory, all of their excellence will become like a smoldering uh, charcoal pit. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah ended up being after God dropped fire out of heaven on them just a big plane of smoke. Then we have the city of Babylon's destiny in verses 19 to 22. Verse 20, It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there in their houses and be full of doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there and satyrs shall dance there satyrs is uh, the Greek mythological term for uh, demon demon goats do you remember um, in other words this is a word for evil spirits evil spirits shall dwell there and the wild beast by the way in the book of Revelation doesn't it say something about Babylon being inhabited by Revelation 18.2. Let's have a look there. Uh, 
Revelation 18.2, NIV here. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excess. At this point in the book of Revelation, the great Babylon means something entirely different than just the city. But as goes the city, so goes the antitype, if you want to call it that, the fulfillment of it, the apocalyptic version of Babylon in the book of Revelation. What animal is represented the animal? The, the satyr, the the the, the, uh, it's the satyr is a is a Greek mythological no, it's a, it's a goat, a goat with the man's head, isn't that what it is? But that's also just don't forget that's a King James word, okay? And the NIV says and just simply because of time I d you know couldn't and and I don't have my Hebrew Bible with me I left it down south because I didn't think I'd be teaching uh, at, to this degree but uh, um, I don't know what the Hebrew word is here I should look it up in the online Bible um, but the NIV says uh, evil spirit instead of satyr I think gold. What's, what's the reference again? oh is it says wild goats in yours? and is that NIV? Yes. oh okay wild goats is the Certainly a symbol, yeah. Um, <coughs> incidentally, Babylon here is described with the same kind of descriptors that is used of the branch in Isaiah 4.2. It talks about the glory of Babylon. It's the same word where, uh, that is used to describe the glory of the branch and the fruit of the land. Uh, and the excellency of the fruit of the land. Also, um, the contrast here is is so marked in verse 19. It says, The glory of the kingdoms and the beauty of the Chaldees' excellence shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and it shall never be inhabited, whereas the house of David in the Lord Jesus Christ will be an eternal habitation, and his glory will be eternal and will not pass away. Um, then in chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, we have the Lord's compassion on Israel. Uh, I'm sorry, verses 1 to 2. Chapter 14, verses 1 to 2. Just two verses that deal with the Lord's compassion on Israel. Wait a minute. That's right. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord, for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over the, their oppressors. Now, I believe Isaiah here is re predicting the return of the Babylonian captivities uh, to Jerusalem, to the land, and uh, the table is turned. Some of the Babylonians, who were their captors, now become captives. They bring some of them home with them, apparently. Um, leading captivity captive. Remember Ephesians? In one sense, the Lord was uh, captured by man, nailed to the cross, and yet in the resurrection, he leads captivity captive. 
and gives gifts unto men. You know, giving gifts unto men, the returning army coming home would give out the loot, you know, the booty, giving gifts. The imagery in the New Testament just fits so well with uh, what the customs and practices were in those days, and in Old Testament days. <coughs> That section, ver chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, belongs in the whole Babylonian section because it's just kind of an excursus that tells you that uh, in, in the pronouncement of this Babylonian woe, Israel returns home. I'm sorry, that was chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. What was the heading for what? 19, the city of Babylon's destiny. Chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. The Lord's compassion on Israel. In other words, Israel returns home. And here again, I believe we have a near and a far fulfillment of Israel returning home. Israel is not totally home yet. Uh, she doesn't have all the land yet, and not all of her people are back home. Um, and so I believe that the complete fulfillment of that is yet to come. Interesting to see what will happen under Netanyahu these days, because he's a, more of a conservative character, and uh, open far more to listen to the Likud party, which is the conservative party, I think, if I have it right in my head. And uh, they're the ones, of course, who are not willing to compromise land for peace. And um, last I saw on the news, he was not willing to back down on the excavation of this tunnel where they are trying to... Uh, uh, what, what, what's this? Do you remember anyone been following the news lately? Uh, what the excavation of this tunnel is all about? The Hezekiah Tunnel. Is it the Hezekiah Tunnel? Yeah, they try to... They tried to the They're excavating it, yeah, just archaeologically. Kind of yeah. But yeah. The, the Islam well, the Palestinians land. are mad because uh, it's getting too close to the Dome of the Rock, which is the Muslim temple, the place of worship, where Abraham supposedly uh, offered his son. I was, when I was there, 6 o'clock in the morning, the, my radio alarm is coming on. Uh -huh. Next to the door, one man hears Christ, why you see uh-huh well <coughs> okay now we have a taunt against Babylon this is still uh, under the title against Babylon the oracle against Babylon here is a taunt against Babylon in chapter 14 verses 3 to 23 chapter 14 Verse 3 to 23, a taunt against Babylon. Actually, it's I should have said verse 4 to 23, but uh, no, verse 3, because this is where God um, pronounces rest for Israel. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say. So Isaiah is talking to the returned captives who are now free in the land, and he's saying to them, this is what you will sing. <laughs> you will sing this song. You will say this proverb or this taunt against Babylon. And here it is. How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Feller not being slang for fellow, but uh, uh, a lumberjack. Yeah. Now, listen to this next passage. I just love this. I mean, it's, it's, 
it's it's a bad scene for Babylon. <laughs> but listen, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Here are all the ghosts and goblins of uh, days gone by, of all the powerful men who are now in hell, who are getting up out of their thrones and their seats or whatever, to meet uh, the king of Babylon, who is coming to join them in the fires of hell. And all of them shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? <laughs> Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, I don't know what that means, we'll find out. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Listen to the NIV. Lutes. Pardon me? Lutes. Lutes. And here we have... Um, <clears throat> the grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming, and rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you, all those who are leaders in the world. It makes them rise from their thrones, all those who were kings over the nations. They will all respond. They will say to you, You also have become weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave. Along with the noise of your harps, maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. That's, uh, that's what awaits the king of Babylon. And the king of Babylon doesn't even exist at this point yet, at his point in prediction. Interesting, interestingly enough, <clears throat> uh, the higher critics of the 19th century and the German rationalists looked at Isaiah and saw all of the predictions in chapters 40 to 66 and said, well, that possibly, can't possibly have been written in the 8th century. This was written in the 5th or 4th century and uh, because, because of all these names that were predicted uh, specifically, like Cyrus of Persia, but uh, even way back in the first part of uh, the book of Isaiah, Babylon and Medo-Persia is mentioned by name, with the um, captivity, the seven years captivity, as well as the, the freeing of the captives mentioned, returning to the land, and Babylon's destruction by Mede. So, taunt from the other side of the grave, verses nine and tell we have nine and ten we have hell's amazement. Hell is amazed. We have a little bit of C. S. Lewis in the Bible. Have you noticed? You know, if any of you have read, uh, have any of you read the Great Divorce, C. S. Lewis? Oh man, I wish I could make that homework. One to eight. Verses 3 to 8 is, The oppressor is ceased. Verses 3 to 8, The oppressor is ceased. Oh, maybe an interesting note under this passage where the oppressor has ceased in verses 3 to 8. Notice the talk about the trees. The oppressor. Yeah, um, verse, okay, here it is. The oppressor is ceased, verse 3 to 8. Taunt from the other side of the grave, verse 9 to 23. Then under the taunt from the other side of the grave, we have hell's amazement, verse 9 to 10. Final reality sets in, verse 11. The final reality is maggots are spread out over you, the worms cover you. It's, it's interesting, I don't know my views for one now. Compare with the other judgment for Assyria or Moab or Palestine, other nations. In, in, the, in Babylon's judgments, they mention about the uh, hair, or underneath hair. Hell? It means it's, it's, uh, even the spiritual dam implied. Mm -hmm. So this passage is uh, not only Babylon, the visible country at the time, yeah. but the whole spiritual Babylon is eternally is dam, and kind of implies. Mm -hmm. the other Moab or other nation, they just uh, also the punishment. Just destroyed, yeah. But <coughs> Something um, worthy of mention in verses 3 to 8 is the mention of the trees. Notice in verse uh, 
After it mentions that all the lands are at rest and at peace and they break into singing, even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you, saying, Now that you have been laid low, no woodsman comes to cut us down. Uh, the trees are speaking, but again, this is figurative language representing the people. But um, historically, it's been shown that when, whenever, uh, when Assyria went and invaded Israel in the north, uh, one of the things that they did was they cut down the huge cedars and took them back to Babylon with them and those cedars are part of uh, uh, the famous hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar became famous for. And so that is known historically and so for the Bible to say uh, the trees are saying there are no hewers to cut us down, that's very, very significant. In fact, oh, i got to show you this. Downstairs I have... Um, in my companion Bible, it shows us a an obelisk. Do you know what an obelisk is? It's a it's a piece of stone that was written on in hieroglyphics, and this is the record of Zennacherib. How would you pronounce that? Zennacherib, the the uh, king of Babylon. That uh, I'm sorry, the king of Assyria, that came against Jerusalem and was his armies were destroyed by the angel of death. He makes mention of that campaign. In this on this obelisk but Assyrians were big braggarts and the kings would never admit defeat and he said on that obelisk this is extra biblical evidence archaeological evidence he said Hezekiah was like a snared bird in my hand those are words directly out of scripture where Hezekiah confessed in his prayer that he felt that the Lord had delivered him uh, out of the hand as a bird out of a cage just, uh, I, I just about whooped when I saw that. <laughs> you know, I love love it when you find uh, extra biblical uh, support and confirmation for what the Bible has said. So um, that campaign really took place. There is historical evidence of it. I mean, I, <laughs> it really took place. It took place because we know, because the Bible says. It, but historically, uh, we have evidence of it. Um, but yeah, one of the one of the things that an invading country always does is it robs the host country of its natural resources and uh, the cedars of Lebanon have always been uh, I mean Israel's been famous for its uh, cedars of Lebanon in biblical times I don't know about now anymore um, also in some writings that I can footnote for you of Nebuchadnezzar himself he stated that they brought this is a quote out of a book written in 1850 something they brought the greatest trees from the summits of Lebanon to Babylon that was part of the record historical record extra biblical record now, we come to a very interesting passage, verses 12 to 17. We're going to discuss this for a while. Pardon me? Verse 11 was with the last section, that's right. That was all part of uh, the final reality, the grave. I suppose you could have included uh, verses 9 to 11 under hell's amazement. Uh, but I just felt like that last verse there was, uh, you know, uh, a fitting close to that statement from hell. But beginning in verse 12, we know this passage because it's been preached on to us plenty of times. I don't know about you, but I've heard this plenty. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. Now let me just tell you right away that the King James only camp gets very upset with the NIVers because it makes it sound here like we are calling Satan the morning star because that's the name of Christ in the New Testament, right? Well, much to do about nothing. And the King James says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The name Lucifer comes from the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. And that was simply transferred, translated from the Hebrew word, which means what? Morning star. Morning star. Shining one. 
Lucifer it means shining one shining one a bright star um, stars are often ref angels are referred to as stars in the Old Testament on occasion and um, this is not a problem um, this is not a technical name morning star and so it can apply to Lucifer because he's the shining one he's an angel of light but in the book of Revelation Jesus is given that title the technical title morning star or son of the morning for me the heading here would be uh, oh I just put down morning star or Lucifer uh, why did I do that? I think this was late in the night already. Um, let's uh, let's um, let's call this the fall of a great one. Eleven to seventeen, or twelve to seventeen, I should say the fall of a great one. That way we cover ourselves in case it turns out that this passage isn't talking about Satan at all. How many of you believe it's talking about Satan? Let me just, I'm just taking a quick poll here. Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four, five. The New Testament, Peter, hmm? Peter, Jude, mention about the Did they mention this passage? No. Is there a New Testament reference that quotes this passage as a reference to Satan? Does anyone know? I think so, but I don't. If you can find it, I would sure love to know about it. If you want to take a moment to check out your cross references list, just as you have Antichrists and you have the Antichrist, okay? You have people who come in the spirit of Antichrist and claim that they are Christ or are simply against Jesus Christ and don't bring the doctrine of Christ. So too you have people who come in the spirit of Satan who behave like he does and in that sense uh, the king of Babylon is certainly a type of the evil one. Uh, I would not take issue with you if you wanted to be dogmatic about um, this passage being a reference to Satan. Uh, in fact, I lean towards believing this is a reference to Satan, but I won't be dogmatic about it. That's the issue here. Uh, if you're not absolutely certain, and the weight of evidence to you comes only from what you've always heard in the pulpit, uh, but you can't really absolutely prove it, then, then I say hang on to it loosely. Uh, you can teach it, uh, and say not absolutely certain about this because the the evidence isn't totally there. But let's look at the evidence and see what it says. The Jude, one uh, verse, Jude, Jude, mm -hmm. 13 is the wandering stars to whom is reserved the blindness of darkness forever. Yes. So the wandering mm -hmm. stars have fallen from their spare place. That's right. So it implies... Yes. Certainly. Um, but um, the kings of the east uh, were referred to uh, with names of heavenly bodies as well. You know, so to call the king of Babylon a morning star is uh, not unusual in that day. Um, at any rate, um, let's look at how this passage treats the king of Babylon how you have fallen from heaven uh, let's use the King James how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which did didst weaken the nations for thou hast said in thine heart I will ascend into heaven I will exalt my throne above the stars of God I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Um, these are all statements of extreme pride and arrogance. 
And taking that face value, it sure sounds like something that Satan would say. It's um, quite likely. But historically, we have to remember that there, if if this is a if this is a double prophecy, if this is speaking of both the king of Babylon and ultimately Satan, then it also has to fit the historical picture. And indeed, as you check back and do some study on the king of Babylon, you will discover that um, the place where they worshipped, number one, Babylon was famous for their tower that reached into the sky, uh, but their place where they worshipped their gods was in a mountain that was often cloaked in clouds, ascending into heaven, exalting my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Some have said, well, this is the Antichrist in the tribulation setting himself in, up in the temple to be on the throne, to be worshipped as God. Um, the only problem is the sides of the north doesn't make sense. That doesn't fit. Um, there's no no reference in in the literature concerning the temple that has anything to do with the north. The temple is not on the north side of Jerusalem, um, but uh, the Hebrew word apparently is. Where's my notes? I don't have it here. At uh, one point last night, I lost my notes on my computer without saving them, and so I had to do some things over again, and that one didn't get back in. So, um, <coughs> sorry? Psalms 48, too, beautiful for situation, toward the whore, is Mount Zion on the sides. Mount Zion the on the sides of the north. The great Interesting. Psalm 48, is Mount Zion on the sides of the Psalm north. Psalm 48, too. Okay, I'm going to have to put that one on hold and uh, come back to that. Because if that is true, that this is a reference to um, the Temple of Jerusalem or Mount Zion in, in the uh, way it was meant to be, then I think that that pretty well clinches it that this is um, Satan because certainly um, the king of Babylon never aspired to be seated uh, in Jerusalem to have his throne in Jerusalem you know um, I'm going to do some further study on that I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Um, for Babylonian kings to be deified, or for any rulers in that day to be deified, that's what their aim always was. I mean, even right up until Roman times, the emperors were to be worshipped as gods. So, if it fits, if it's Lucifer, it has both a near reality and a far reality, a near fulfillment and a far, far fulfillment. But look at the results. In verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. This is simply repeating what it said before. Your pomp is brought down to the grave. Verse 11, The noise of thy flutes, or harps, the worm is spread under thee, and maggots cover you. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying is this the man that made the earth tremble and that did shake kingdoms that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners so um, that's the end of the king of Babylon and the ultimate end of the devil as well if this refers to him, even if it doesn't, um, it will be his end. Verses 24 to... Oh wait, this passage about Lucifer goes all the way to verse 23, right? 
Yeah. Uh, verse 18, all the kings of the nations, even all them lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave. Oh, this is going back to the king of Babylon, sorry. Thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people, the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Um, it was a shameful thing to be buried, to to die and not be buried. Do you remember uh, King, what was Jezebel's husband's name, Ahaz? Uh, it was predicted that he would be eaten by dogs in the east. That's That's a horrible thing, to not be buried, to not have some kind of decent burial. Even today, it's, it's uh, uh, shameful. And so this was predicted of the king of Babylon that he would not even be buried. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. Verse 21, Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord, and will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the bosom, basin, which is a broom, of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Um, I neglected to give that heading, that portion there, a heading, because that does not fit under the um, fall of the Great One. <laughs> Babylon. You could call it the ongoing destruction of Babylon or the ongoing fate. Of Babylon it still has to do with the grave you notice the whole section here has to do with his death covered by worms uh, brought down to hell hell's occupants rise up to meet him um, and express their amazement at him uh, the reason for his fall is really uh, what verse 12 to 17 is all about is his pride and his arrogance in fact, you'll notice that in every one of these judgments, a reason is given, and it's always a moral reason. And in most cases, it's pride. If there's one lesson you can learn about the rise and fall of the kingdoms of the world, the powerful kingdoms of the world, is their arrogance and their pride that makes them fall. And that's what's happening to our society today. Um, we don't have much longer, I don't think, as a nation. Neither does the USA. Uh, because of our pride. We, but the human nourish the, the, the laws of pride. In, so they say the science tell that uh, woman lesbian is uh, okay. Yeah. There is a pride. Yes. They do not the last divine to see. That's correct. So now we begin with a prophecy against Samaria, uh, Assyria in chapter 14, verse 24 to 27. The attention shifts from Babylon to Assyria. Verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and I has, as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot, then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? Verse 24 to 27, I wonder if we can break it apart here. First of all, how often is the word purpose used? In verses 24 to 27. And what do you think the main thought is? Hmm? Judgment uh, to Assyria. Yes, judgment to Assyria. Purpose and purposes. Three times in 26 and 27. The word purpose is used four times. Verse 24 to 27. Oh, that's right. Um, 
verse 24, we have one mention, right? Okay, I didn't see that one. Um, so, what's, what's, how would you entitle this section? What kind of heading would you give it? <laughs> how about that? Give that man a chocolate bar. The Lord's purpose stands fast against Assyria. Verse 24 to 27. Verse 28 to 32, we have a pronouncement against Palestina, which is really Philistines. The Philistines. Do we have a map up here? James, can you do you know where the Philistines lived? Okay, they were a coastal region.